Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Dalewood Baptist Church. It's so good to see everyone here this morning. Um, it's an exciting day. Uh, we got we have a special guest with us this morning. Uh, Tanner Field will be bringing our message today. So Tanner, thank you for being here. Uh, you'll remember Tanner. He was here back in June on the first Sunday of June. So if you're here that day, uh, we're just so glad to have him back. So Tanner, welcome. Uh, but for everyone else, I want to welcome you too. Whether you're here joining us in person. Uh, or you're worshiping with us online. We're just so thankful that all of you are here with us today, worshiping together. I know we've got some people who have uh, been here for a long time, some people who are newer, but whatever the case may be, we're just so thankful that all of you are here to worship with us. Um, we're going to get started in just a second. I'm trying to buy a second for Lindsay to get back. I think she's getting Noah situated in the nursery, so I want to give her a second to come back and um, come up on stage with us. But um, I'll just remind you guys of a couple of things. Um, I uh, want to remind you guys about our 70th anniversary coming up uh, at the end of August. I'm going to talk more about that at the end of the service, but I just want to remind you to be thinking about who you can invite. I also want to let you guys know we're going to have a sign-up for a fellowship. We'll open that sign-up on Wednesday. I'll give you more details at the end of the service, but I uh, just want to make sure that you guys knew about that and we're thinking about who to invite. So uh, with that said, we're going to go ahead and stand and sing some songs together. We're going to start with a song called Glorious Day. So would you stand as we sing together?
glorious day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, church family and Tanner. Thank you for being here with us this morning. This time of uh, our service, it's a time to come to the Lord in prayer for those needs that we have. And uh, I know that many of you have uh, unspoken requests and things that you've been praying about on a daily, regular basis. So we want to continue to do that. But right now, we've got some specific things that we want to pray for. Uh, Miss Bernie Shiny was uh, laid to rest yesterday out at Woodlawn. That was at 3 o'clock. We want to continue to be with her family, her son, her daughter, and during that time, and uh, during this time, these days uh, afterwards, too. We want to pray for uh, Shirley Russell. Uh, Shirley's going to have uh, cancer surgery on August the 11th at 1130 out at uh, Sarah Cannon Cancer Center. So we want to 
be praying for her. She called Connie and I the other day and let us know about that. And uh, if you hadn't already known it, you can uh, certainly continue to be in prayer for her today. Uh, like I said, I'm sure many of you have burdens this morning. And, uh, any 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 requests anybody would like to share before we start? Okay. okay, at that time, Father, we'll just uh, come to you today. We want to pray for our future here at Delwood. Thank you for all that uh, is going on. Thank you for Tanner being here with us this morning. The pastor will be with us in the first three Sundays in August. So let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, we do come to you, Lord, with thankfulness in our hearts. Thank you for loving us in such a special way. May we all think back to the day or the time in our lives when things changed from thinking of worldly wisdom to godly spiritual wisdom. Thank you for how you've blessed us and with us, how you've lived within us every day, Father, from that day forward. Help us in the future to continue to trust you, Father, to trust the Holy Spirit that is there to guide us in every way, Father. Father, as we come to our time of uh, worship this morning, to sing more hymns this morning, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for our presence together as we gather together. Father, we want to pray for the future of Dale Wood. We want to pray for Shirley Russell. We want to pray for Bernice Shiny's family, Father, to just uh, continue to be with them during these times. Father, we just never know uh, when the time will come for each of us, Father, that you might call us home. Help us to be reminded of how important each day is to trust you, to commune with you, to pray with you, and to uh, look to you for the satisfaction of our daily spiritual lives every day. So, Father, just guide us today, and, and we ask your blessings on Tanner as he comes to share our message this morning. Father, just glorify yourself today in all that you are. In Christ's name, we give you the praise. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, as Steve mentioned, we've had several deaths in our church family in the last couple of weeks. And, you know, we've also got other things we're praying for. And in addition to those, um, those health things that we just prayed about, I know that many of you are probably carrying some sort of burden, too. And um, so as we sing after that song, I always like to, to think about that as we sing uh, and not just try to ignore it and, and sing like that. Those things don't exist. And so this is a song that I think most everybody in the room would be familiar with, and it's a song that was written in the in the midst of some heartbreak, too. So I think it's a great way uh, just to remember um, that it is still well with my soul and all those things happen. So let's stand and sing this together. Let's sing together. When when
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sunday. We're so thankful to have Tanner Field here to do our service. And maybe he'll reach someone that doesn't know you, Lord, and they'll come forward. We pray for these tithes and offerings. All we have is yours, Heavenly Father. We should always remember that. May that you bless the gift and the giver. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
As I said, you were so welcoming last time and, and uh, you didn't disappoint again this morning. Thank you for just the hellos and, and the welcomes. And um, this, this I truly find Dalewood to be a very beautiful church and we have a wonderful, wonderful congregation here. Uh, I do wanna dive right in. We're gonna be uh, primarily looking at Romans chapter six, uh, verses five through 11, but I'll warn you, we're, we're primarily looking at one word from this passage, which will lead us into a lot of different other passages that we're going to be kind of looking at. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. In Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 5 through 11, let me, let me go ahead and read this for us. Beginning in verse 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word that I want us to focus on this morning, the central word in this passage is found in verse 7, where we read, for one who has died has been set free. This morning we're going to be talking about the idea of freedom. Now I want as an exercise, if you, if you would entertain me, I want you to clear your minds. And when I say the word freedom, I want you to think about the first thing that comes to mind when you hear that word, freedom. Some of you might think of uh, birds flying in the sky. Maybe uh, I'm from Oklahoma. I think about the wide open plains. Maybe you think about uh, a, a ship setting sail out to sea. Perhaps you think about uh, some of you car lovers driving a 1960s Chevy convertible down the countryside road, or maybe a Ford Mustang if you're a Ford guy. Um, some of you might be thinking of, of ideas that freedom brings, the idea of the Declaration of Independence or the proclamation of emancipation. Or you think about Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous speech, uh, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Or maybe you think about America itself and what we, America boasts that it is founded upon, the idea of freedom. Or maybe you're like me, you're a movie lover. You think of Mel Gibson laying down on a table, screaming his heart out, freedom in the famous Braveheart classic. The, the word freedom is a loaded word. It's a word that so many people would have so many different thoughts on and so many different ideas. You might find yourself uh, in a group of people or maybe uh, on a, a chat online or something talking about the word, idea, uh, the word freedom and realize that, that not everybody in the conversation is talking about the same thing. When we hear the word freedom, we might think of a lot of different things. It is my heart this morning to talk about freedom um, 
because I think it's central to the idea of what it really means to be a Christian. And it's it's an idea that our culture has has fallen very far from. We live in a country that boasts this concept of freedom, this idea of being free. And yet, I fear that our culture has identified freedom as being more has been more about the question of what I can do. What rights do I have? What can I do and when can I do it with the least amount of consequences possible? That's freedom. But I would argue this morning that freedom is less about the question, what can I do? And it's more about the question, who am I? And the answer to that question is what will truly set us free. The answer to the question that we all ask throughout our lives, who am I? What is my purpose? Why am I here? That answer is what will set us free. But it's not any answer will do. It's one specific answer to that question. We are people made in the image of God who have fallen short of His glory, but have been saved by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. That's who we are. But I want us to look at Romans 6 here and actually explore what the ideas that Paul is bringing to the table. Our author Paul, the the author of Romans, um, when we think of this idea of freedom. As I asked earlier, I asked you to think about something when I said the word freedom. And And I'm willing to bet that if Paul was here this morning, And I was to ask him the same thing. I was to ask him, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word freedom? Interestingly enough, I think that his answer would be one that none of us probably thought of. His answer probably would have been death. A radical answer. But we look at our text here, we see in uh, verse 5, united in a death like his, or like this. Uh, Verse 6, old self was crucified uh, verse 7 one who has died set free, has been set free verse 11 consider yourself dead in fact Paul uses a word associated with death whether it be death itself dead died crucified he uses it nine times in these six verses it's 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 actually more of the central theme is all about death in this part of the book of Romans but he's he's talking about the reality of freedom that comes with it. now why does Paul mention death as something so closely associated or necessary for the the reality of freedom to take place in our lives. Well, because like most would agree, and and Paul is is advocating here, that in order to be truly free, we have to first detach ourselves from something. A slave must detach him or herself from their master. A prisoner must detach him or herself from their prison cell. In order to be free, we have to, in some way, detach ourselves from those chains or those things in which are holding us back from true freedom. But notice that Paul does not advocate that freedom is defined by mere detachment from all things. There are other religions, there are other ideas, there is a concept in freedom that would suggest that true freedom is when we are completely detached from all things necessary. But that's not what Paul says. It's not that we will be free when we are completely detached from all things, but when we are detached from the wrong things, and we are attached to the right things. Paul says you must die to sin so that you can live Christ. A bird needs its wings. A ship needs its sails. And people created in the image of God need the Savior Jesus Christ to set us truly free and to live in freedom with Him. Freedom is not mere just detachment from all things that we have to be held accountable to. It's attaching ourselves to the thing, the right thing. 
and it's becoming who we were always meant to be, who we were made to be. A bird is meant to fly. A ship is meant to sail. And people are meant to live a life of glorifying God. And so I, I do I want to explore three main points uh, as we talk about the practical aspects of, of freedom. Okay, my main points, uh, we're, we're going to be, like I said, we're going to be jumping around. The first, the first passage I want to look at is in John chapter 8. This is a very familiar verse to you, John chapter 8, verse 32. Many of you may know it. Jesus says uh, to the Jewish people, the truth shall set you free. And it's my first point this morning that freedom requires the truth. And so I do want to go to this passage, however, because uh, this is one of the most famous uh, verses in the Bible, and, and not just in the Bible, but it's one of the most famous sayings that that's out there. The, 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 the saying, the truth shall set you free. So much so that often uh, many people have forgotten that it is even a quote from the Bible itself. You will often see the phrase, the truth shall set you free in uh, academic circles. Many schools will have this up as, a, as an idea that if you know we grow in knowledge, we learn more of the truth, and we knowledge with knowledge comes power, and with power comes freedom. The truth shall set, set you free. Um, we may have even many people have even associated this saying with uh, the founding fathers of America: "The truth shall set us free." And freedom, this idea of freedom, this idea of of, of a new world in which we would be free from the old worlds that held us back. But actually, this is a Christian concept. This is a Jesus saying a Jesus idea the truth shall set you free and very few of us actually know the conversation that circled around this saying that he said it's from the book of John John chapter 8 beginning in verse 31 I'll paraphrase this for you but if you want to look down and kind of read it yourself you're welcome to Jesus is having a conversation with um, as John kind of classifies them he generalizes it as, as saying that Jesus was speaking to the Jews uh, we have to remember that John was uh, writing primarily to a Greek audience. And so he didn't necessarily um, specify in, in most of his gospel the difference between the Pharisees or the Sadducees or these different religious sects, but rather just generalize and saying the Jews. But it's important for us to remember that this isn't a, a message that's just Christian versus Jews, but it's actually a message about a certain, a certain group of people within the Jewish circle. More than likely, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees or some type of religious leaders who were uh, the, the driving force in wanting him to be crucified. And he says to them this saying, he says, the truth shall set you free. And they reply, the Jews reply to him and say, what do you mean? We're already free. What do you, we don't need to be set free. We are the children of Abraham. And Jesus, you know, over and over again says, no, no, you're like your father. You do the works of your father. You, you lie, you steal, you cheat. And they keep going back to him. We are the, what are you, our father is Abraham. Are you speaking ill against Abraham? And father, or sorry, Jesus uh, eventually corrects them. It's actually in verse 44 where he says, uh, that your father is that of the devil. Yes, you are the people of Israel. Your lineage is found in Abraham. But if you were truly children of Abraham, then you would recognize me. You would know who I am. You would believe the words that I'm saying to you because they are the words from the father himself. We're reminded it was uh, one of the disciples who said to John and John chapter 14, or sorry, he said to Jesus in John chapter 14, um, that, you know, show us, show us the Father, and, 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 and that's enough. And he says, have I been with you this whole time, and you, you still don't recognize me? I am the embodiment of the Father. He has sent me. I, I represent him as his great mediator here in the world. I am the Son of God. And to recognize me is to recognize the Father. And so the Jewish people at this time, or the, the, the certain group that Jesus was speaking to, they were seeking to crucify him. And Jesus said, you can't be free. You can't possibly be free if 
you don't even know the truth. I'm telling you the word of God. And you reject it. Now, why is it that the truth is something that um, is so freeing to us? Well, we know that it's just a reality of life that you can't really be free on the grounds of something that's a lie. You know, there was this classic movie, uh, maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't. Uh, it's gained quite the cult following uh, from the early 2000s. It's called The Matrix. Uh, it's a movie, of, basically, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. It's a movie about a, a, a normal guy who works in an office building, I think, somewhere in New York. And just, you know, has a normal nine to five job, normal life, normal guy. And then one day everything changes when he's told that everything, his whole reality is actually just a construct. It's, it's, it's not real. It's, it's, um, he's living in a, in a false world that was created by these robots. And an actual, the actual reality is that he's in a pod and the robots are using him along with everybody else in, in the world as basically a battery to, to charge, um, their, their modern world. It's been a while since it's in the movie. Sorry if I'm butchering it. But uh, essentially, he's given this choice. You can live comfortably in your, your false world where you have a job, where you have ambition, where you have comfort, where you can eat good food, nobody bothers you. Or you could come to the real world where there's a war going on, where there is no comfort, where you have very little food, where there is no promise of tomorrow but it's real. And in the movie, of course, he chooses the latter. He chooses the reality over the, the fake. So many of us in this world, we, we're living in a false reality. We, 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 we pursue things to, in the pursuit of happiness and the chance to find joy. We pursue all these temporary things in this world, these things that come and go and pass away. We put so much effort into developing, uh, you know, building this life around us that's really more of just a canopy of safety rather than it is what we were truly meant to live for and do with our lives. So Jesus says, you've got to be set free. Come to the truth. And the problem with these Jewish leaders is that they, they weren't, the reason they weren't living in the truth is because, yes, they had the law of Moses. Yes, they, they had the, the, the truth of, of, of the, the true history of God and, and, and Abraham and, and the, the descendants of their people and, and how God had brought them into this promised land. And they had all of this. And yet they weren't even honest with themselves because if they had been honest with themselves, they would know that they had fallen short of the requirements of God. They had fallen short of what God was meaning the nation of Israel to be. This is why Jesus called the Pharisees hypocrites. At one point, in great boldness, he even said, you are whitewashed tombs. You are sculpted beautifully on the outside. You are washed with a beautiful white color. But on the inside, you are dead. You walk in and there's nothing but a carcass. The Pharisees of his time, their great sin was that they were putting a mask of righteousness over their sinful selves. They were wearing a cloak of false righteousness over the sinful, prideful reality that they lived in. And Jesus said, you're not really free. It was Jesus who sat at the table with prostitutes and tax collectors. And these same men said to him, how dare you sit with me? And he said, I did not come for the righteous. I came for the sinners. It is a great fear that we should have as a church, as individuals, as a people, that when Christ returns, Woe to us if he comes to us and we say, Jesus, we're so glad that you've come back. And he looks at us and says, I didn't come for you. You wear a mask of righteousness. I came for those who have confessed their sin, who, live, who, who have embraced the reality that they are sinners, but they have come and looked to me for forgiveness 
of that sin. The church is not a place where we come to, to cloak ourselves with something to cover up our sin. The church is a place that we come to, in the words of Martin Luther, the great reformer, to sin boldly. Now, I want to, I want to, uh, uh, I want to explain that when, when Luther said sin boldly, he didn't mean sin all you want and it doesn't matter. He's, he meant own your sin. Confess your sin. When you sin, and no doubt we will all sin, there, sin will happen. We, we will stumble and fall, but the, the righteous will be the ones who get up and say, yes, I have sinned and I need the blood of Christ for forgiveness. But the world will say, no, we either justify that sin or we cover that sin. But that's not freedom. To justify a sin, to say, oh, it's not as bad as, as we've made it out to be, or to cover it up, to hide it under our bed, to put it in our closet, that's not real freedom. That's not embracing who we really are. We are ragamuffins. We are broken, torn down people who have been marred by sin in our lives. We've made mistakes. We've done wrong. And we can confess that. That's freedom. To sit at the table of God and say, yes, I'm a prostitute. I'm a tax collector. I'm a sinner. But I love you, Jesus, and I know you love me. And I have embraced you. I have come home. And the father has ran to the prodigal son. That's freedom. And we can only truly be free when we embrace the truth and the reality that we are sinners and we need a Savior. My point number two is we're going to look at Romans chapter 13, verse 12. You don't have to turn there, though. It's just one verse. Uh, point number two is freedom requires letting go. Paul says in Romans 13, verse 12, at the plea, he says, The night is far spent. The day is at hand. So let us therefore put down the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. There was once a bird that was captured and put into a cage. It grew up in the cage. It spent years in the cage. It was fed seed every morning had shelter, it had comfort. It learned to embrace its cage. One day the bird was let go and it did not go far at all before it turned back around and went back into its cage because the cage had become all that the bird had ever known. The bird could have flown far above the trees into the clouds it could have spread its wings, and it could have been what it was always truly meant to be. But it settled for the cage because of the comfort that it wants. We are not so different than a caged bird. We all have our vices. We all have our sinful habits that we use as coping mechanisms to survive in this world. As a way to get comfort, as a way to be comforted, as a way to uh, create this canopy around us, this construct uh, that we're comfortable in, that we feel safe in. But the problem with that is we weren't meant to be. Yes, being a Christian, excuse me, uh, being a Christian is, is hard. Jesus has promised this. The foxes have holes, or the birds have nests, but the disciple of Christ has nowhere to lay his head. As they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. There, there is a guarantee that the Christian life will require a great amount of sacrifice, discomfort, heartache, suffering, persecution. But we will be like birds soaring in the sky, high above the trees, into the clouds, because we will be what we were always meant to be. Vessels for the glory of God to, to carry out the work of God. This is, what, this is who we are as people. We are made in God's image. 
And we were made to serve him and to know him and to experience him. And anything else is just a cage keeping us from who we're supposed to be. And it's who we are that really defines our freedom. It's not what we can do. And I know that for those who live in the world, for those who do not know Christ, it's easy for them to, to look into the walls of the church and think, that doesn't seem like freedom to me. I have to, there's requirements, I have to go to church every Sunday, you know, I've got to join the membership. Uh, there's certain, um, certain activities that I need to say no to, you know. Uh, there's sinful activities that are fun, pleasurable, enjoyable, that I no longer can do if I'm a Christian. There's more freedom if I don't constrict myself to the boundaries of religion. It's understanding why someone in the world would think that. But often even in the church, and perhaps even some of you this morning, deep down in your hearts, you've been going to church for years and years. You've been a professing believer, maybe most of your life. And yet there's a part of you inside that might be tempted to believe the lie that, that this religious life that you've chosen is holding you back keeping you from enjoying the pleasures of this world. We look out into the world to see people who have casually adopted a lifestyle of partying, of, uh, of, of drinking, of, of uh, sexual habits, of being something that uh, we know is, is contrary to nature, as Paul speaks of in Romans 1. And we think that looks like freedom. But again, freedom is not so much about being able to do more things. It's about being who you were supposed to be. And who you were born to be. But in order to do that, we have to let go of those desires. We have to let go of thinking that those things in the world can satisfy those deep desires can satisfy the, the purpose and meaning that we think that we need in life, that we, that we do need in life. And it's hard. But we let it go. Like a bird who needs to just let go of the cage. There's something so much better out there. To fly and to be free in who you really are. A child of God. That's freedom. But we've got to let it go. We've got to put down the works of darkness. We've got to wake up. We've got to know that the night has been around for too long. The sun has risen. It's daytime. Finally, in point number three, I want to just close in, in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts 26. There's a story here that's really incredible. It's a story I first heard when I was in college. And I just want to share it with you this morning. My, my final point is point number three. Freedom is who you are not. Or excuse me. Freedom is who you are, not what you have. Freedom is who you, you are, not what you have. Um, Paul has find, found himself, uh, he has, he's been arrested. The Jewish people uh, accused him of causing distress, um, of, of you know, preaching blasphemy, They've convinced the Romans to, to imprison him. Uh, in his imprisonment, he appeals to Caesar. And so there's a whole process of uh, legal um, steps he has to take in order to get the audience before Caesar. As a Roman citizen, he had the right to appeal to Caesar. Um, but when during his waiting and his time, he, he has the opportunity to speak before Governor Festus and King Agrippa. And... Uh,
about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. You see what is happening in this story. This is a, a normal man who grew up in a small region, the small corner of the great empire of Rome. He is a prisoner. He is the only one among the people with chains around his hands. And he says to a king of Rome, who has everything, I wish that you were like me. You see this boldness. That Paul, a prisoner, a poor man, a traveler, a wayward in this world, would say to a king, I have something even greater than you've ever had or known, and I wish you had it too. Oh, that we would be like this. Oh, that we would, we would, we would treat every day like Paul did. That even as a prisoner, he would say, Yes, I have chains around me, but I am more free than every man and woman in this entire audience. Because I have Christ. Because I can look at my sin and not coil and not fear of the judgment to come, but rather I can sin boldly in the words of Martin Luther. And I can confess it and I can say, yes, I am a sinner, but God is a great Savior. That is the freedom in Christ. And I would hope that that is truly how we as Christians could wake up every day and not think of this Christian life, which is hard, as a burden, but as a joy. A joy to rise up and fly in who we really are. Freedom is about being a child of Knowing that death has no sting and sin has no power. King Agrippa, I don't know if he ever gave his life to Christ, I sure hope so. But his wealth is gone. His body is a carcass buried 2,000 years deep in the dirt. And the message of Paul still lives today among us here. That message has been brought all this way for each one of us. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ. Right now you can be free. Maybe you've given it to Him, but the, 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 the weightiness of the lies of the devil is, is heavy upon your heart. And you struggle to truly just fall into that freedom of Christ. Fall into it now this morning. But the truth is good. God loves you. Even as a sinner. So be bold and admit, yes, I fall short. But I know that Jesus' love, Jesus' love is there waiting. I hope that we will rest in that today. Thank you once again for allowing me to come preach a message to you this morning. May God bless you, may God keep you, and uh, may we just may we just pray it out. Father God, I thank you for Daily Baptist Church, Lord. I thank you for the ministry that you've brought uh, upon this congregation in this part of the world, in this part of Nashville, this part of this neighborhood. God, I uh, am so encouraged to, to, to hear, as, as Jonathan was sharing with me, that um, here soon the Daily will be celebrating, I believe it's the 70th, um, 70th anniversary. God, you have been faithful to this church for 70 years. And yes, there is discouragement. As, as um, you know, we, there would meet in a gym, uh, not being able to meet in the, in the building that you provided for them so many years ago. And, and uh, as many churches are suffering, we, we look at our numbers, and we wish that more could experience this. We wish that more could come and be in fellowship with us. But 
But God, I, I thank you for the faithfulness that you've given this church all these years. And we know and we will trust and lean on the reality that you will continue to be faithful. But Lord, the only question is, will we be faithful unto the work that you've given us? I pray that we would indeed. I pray for Dale Wood. Give them the strength to be faithful. To just to do the work of God to whatever to live truly in the kingdom of Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Tanner. As we respond to the words that Tanner shared with us today, I'd love it if you'd stand with me and sing as we sing the song, Come Ye Sunday. you guys about a couple of things coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but first off, if you're new this morning, I just want to let you know that we'd love to connect with you after the service. I'll be out in the lobby and I'd love to meet you if it's your first time here. So I uh, just want to invite anyone who is new today to do that. Uh, we'd just love to connect with you here at Dalewood. Also want to remind you about some things coming up. Our Wednesday prayer and Bible study will meet this Wednesday at 11 o'clock in the fireside room. That's the room right off the side of the lobby there on the right side. Um, and also I want to share with you who's going to be here the next few weeks. Uh, we'll have Michael Kelly, the Executive Director of the Nashville Baptist Association. Uh, we'll be here on Wednesdays in August. So starting this Wednesday and then the next three Wednesdays to follow, uh, Michael Kelly will be here leading our Wednesday Bible study. So I'm really excited to have him. I know he'll do a wonderful job for us, and it'll be great to have him here. So be sure and be here 11 o'clock Wednesday, every Wednesday in August for Michael Kelly. And then the next three Sundays, uh, we're going to have someone by the name of Jason Dukes. Uh, doing our Sunday worship on the first three Sundays of August. Uh, Jason uh, is involved with Brentwood Baptist Church. Um, he was their campus pastor at uh, Harpeth Heights for a little while, and then um, he was the campus pastor of their Nolensville campus when they first opened that. Uh, so Jason has a lot of uh, pastoral experience, and I'm sure uh, it'll be great to hear from him. Uh, that'll be the first three Sundays in August and not the fourth one because the last Sunday in August, August 27th, as we mentioned earlier, is our 70th anniversary celebration. So uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of the service, we're going to have a fellowship, and we'll start signups for that on Wednesday. We'll have more details about that next Sunday. Uh, but I want to invite you to um, think about who you can invite to be here with us. Obviously, we'd love for all of you to be here on August 27th. Uh, but anyone you know who has been a part of Dalewood in the past or who um, 
you know, just might have a special um, uh, just care for Dalewood. Might love to be here for that. We're going to invite back some people uh, from our past, former pastors and former worship ministers and other uh, former staff members. And it's just going to be a great day. So I hope that you'll be here. I hope you'll think about who you can invite. And I would love to have you at the fellowship as well. That's August 27th, the last Sunday of August. Uh, so those are some things that are coming up uh, here at Dalewood. But we're going to conclude our service now. Uh, we're going to stand and sing together the song that we opened our service with, uh, Glorious Day. So I'd love it if you'd stand and sing that with us. You call my Thank you. 